Uh, this talk today is going to be about Erlang, about Elixir, about Livebook, it's going to be about web, machine learning. We're going to cover many things, but there are two takeaways that before we get into the talk that I wanted to come out uh, of this talk with, which is one is that uh, the Erlang, Erlang Virtual Machine, um, Robert's going to talk about it in about Erlang, the Erlang Virtual Machine, the closing keynote. But from my point of view, it was created three, maybe four decades ago. And I am still finding patterns and use cases for those ideas from, from back then, which for me is very exciting. And I want to show some of those use cases throughout the talk. And the second one is, the second takeaway is that if we take our programming languages and programming environments out of the terminal, out of the editor, we can gain a lot of wonderful properties and I want to show them too, right? So this talk is going to be all live coded in this tool called Livebook. So who here has used uh, Jupyter Notebooks before? All right, so uh, Livebook, think it's not quite the same as we're going to see, but think about Jupyter Notebooks for Elixir and Erlang, okay? And it's open source, fully open source. You can go, you can go to the website, livebook.dev. You can install your machine. And if you want to learn Erlang and Elixir, it's a great way to get started. So when you install Livebook in your machine, you can create your code notebooks. And here is the code notebook that I prepared for this talk, right? So what is a code notebook for those who are unfamiliar? Well, it's a notebook where we can write prose. We can have sections like welcome and write some text. But we can also write some code. So here's our first Elixir code, right? So Elixir is a dynamic and functional programming language that runs on their Erlang virtual machine. So as a dynamic programming language, I can create a heterogeneous list with a string hello, the integer one, two, three, and the atom banana, right? So I can create this list. And if I want to get the element of a list, for example, so I created, this is a code cell, okay? We call this a code cell because we can write some code. I can evaluate it. I get the result from that evaluation. And then all the variables defined in previous code cells, I can access in a later code cell, right? So as you can, so, you know, if I want to get the element at index zero, right? I do a fetch on that list. I can do mouse over to get access to the documentation of modules, of functions. So it feels like a, an, an ID in some senses, okay? And in the back, just quick feedback. Can you read well the code? Right, fantastic. So one of the first things that I want to, one of the first differences you're going to learn with Livebook, especially for those who have used Jupyter Notebooks before, is that it was designed to leverage the strengths of Erlang and Elixir. And one of those strengths is being a functional programming language. If you have used like Jupyter Notebooks before, you're probably aware that one of the biggest downsides, one of the biggest, maybe not downsides, one of the biggest critics to Jupyter Notebooks is that they are not really reproducible, right? And that's for two reasons. So when you have a Jupyter Notebook, you have code cells like we saw here, but you can execute those code cells in any order, right? Which makes it hard to reproduce. Imagine you share a notebook with somebody and they're like, hey, you know, if you want to get the same result as me, you have to execute the cell five and then three and then go one, two and four, right? So it makes it hard to reproduce because you can execute cells in any order. But not only that, Jupyter Notebooks, they're all about global mutable state. Okay, so here's some visualization that can help us understand a bit better how a Jupyter Notebook would behave. If you have like three code cells, A, B, and C, right? In a Jupyter Notebook, you can execute cell C first. And basically what that is doing is that it's accessing some global state, all right? Doing changes to it and writing it back. And then you can execute cell A. And, and then you can execute cell B, right? So there's both global mutable state and you don't have control over the order of execution, okay? And there are some attempts for improving this for Jupyter Notebook. So for example, they're like, hey, what if we try to linearize some cells? So for example, if cell A defines variable X and cell B uh, use that variable X, then they're like, okay, so if I execute cell B, I need to execute cell A first. They try to track the dependencies between variables. But the issue is that ultimately you still have global mutable state, okay? So if Livebook, because we're targeting a functional programming language, we try to, okay, how we would design a notebook platform for a functional programming language. And our idea, okay, oh, before we go there, 
right? So let me just show the problem. I've got a little bit ahead of myself. So if you get a Jupyter notebook and you have those two cells, x equals 1 and x equals plus 1, every time we execute the second cell, the value of x would increment, right? But here we can see in Livebook, we we'll always get 2. And the way we made this work is really straightforward, right? Because we are building a functional programming language, we just think of each cell as a function, right? You can think, hey, this is a cell that receives an environment. At the beginning, it's empty. There are no variables, right? And then it returns an environment with x set to 1. And then this cell here is going to receive the previous environment and return a new environment with x updated. And then when I execute it again, I grow back to the previous environment, right? So you can really think it about it as a chain of functions, right? So each cell is a function. It has the previous environment. It returns the new environment. When you want to re-execute something, we roll back, right? So it's really straightforward. We have a sequential execution. Everything is immutable by default. So there is no global mutable state there by default, which means that making a notebook reproducible if you want to share with somebody is really straightforward. And now we can like do more interesting things on top of this. So for example, um, here I have uh, two cells, right? One defining x, the other defining x plus one. Let's me, let me add a cell here in the middle that it's y equals two. And now what we do, because everything is sequential, it's clear there is no global mutable state, is, well, if I change the value of x to two, you can see that the last cell here, you can see like it's yellow at the bottom right, because like, hey, this cell is stale because we know the value of x changed it. But because this other cell y does not depend on x, right? It didn't mark as stale, right? It's still, we know the value is still valid. So now we can thinking about, oh, refresh on transparency. We know that when that changes, only this is going to affect. And we can apply all those ideas inside a notebook platform, right? And you don't have to think about it while you're using it, right? It just works. So that's one of the first things, right, where Livebook is different if you are coming from other platforms, right? We are building on these strengths of a functional programming language, okay? So the other thing, now moving on a little bit forward, right? So we talked about Elixir being functional, Livebook leveraging this. But whenever you hear about Erlang and Elixir, one of the things that you're going to hear a lot is we're going to talk a lot about concurrency, okay? So here is some piece of code. And what this code is doing is that it is spawning 1 million processes. So from here on to the rest, to the end of the talk, whenever I say process, I do not mean an operating system process. I mean a very cheap, lightweight thread of execution that runs inside the Erlang virtual machine. Green threads, right? And we can literally create a million of those. So I have ran the cell. And yeah, in about three seconds, right? I created 1 million processes. In those cases, they are short-lived. They just return the atom OK, and that's it. But we can see it return a million of them, right? And in this case, you can see that a process is identified by this thing called a PID, a process identifier. Not different from the operating system one, but in this case, very cheap, very lightweight, can literally create a million of them, right? And all those processes, they are isolated, okay? They are all isolated, and they are all running at the same time. And that's how we get the idea of concurrency. But whenever they need to need some work together, imagine that they need to process a collection together or something, right? Those processes, they do that by communicating via messages. So if you want process to collaborate on something, they have to do so by sending messages to each other. So this is a bit more evolved example, okay? So let's go uh, for it line by line. So what I'm doing here is that I am getting self, self returns the identifier of the current process and assign it to the variable parent. And now I'm going to start a child process by calling spawn. So I'm starting a child process. And what the child process is going to do is that it's going to wait for a ping message. So it's just going to wait there. And when it receives a ping message, it's going to send a pong to the parent, okay? And then after we spawn the child, we send it a ping message, right? And then because we sent it a ping message, the parent is expecting a pong message. And if it receives the pong, it's going to return the atom, it worked. Okay, so if I execute this, it prints it worked, right? But here's the issue with this code. I'm asking you, 
to build in your head the intuition about, oh, there is a process. And then they have to send messages between each other, right? And then I'm asking you to try like to visualize what this code is doing. But here's the thing, because Livebook is a rich medium, right? It's a rich platform. What if it's running on the browser? What if we don't use that to help us understand the code that we write? So what we can do, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to get this code and I'm going to wrap this into a function called render sec trace. Okay, so I'm not going to change the code in any way. I'm just going to wrap it in a function. And you can see here that it's using a module called Kino. So this is a separate package and Kino is a sibling to Livebook. You can think that Livebook is like it's static. It's just a notebook, right? It's completely static. But whenever you want to animate something, right? You use Kino to give it this idea of animation. So if I wrap this code in this function and I execute it, now it gives us like a communication diagram, right? So I no longer have to say, hey, visualize everything in your head. We can actually now have something, have some feedback from the platform, right? And it's saying, look, so there is self, right? Which is the, the current process. It spawns a child process. Yeah, that tracks. That's happening here, right? And then it sends a ping message, and it gets a Pong message back. And now I can start visualizing it. And it's way better for us to build an intuition. All right? Let's see what else we can do with Livebook. Okay? So here's some other code, right? Um, and what this code is doing is that it's calling render sec trace again. So we're going to trace another diagram. And this is a code that is meant to represent something that you would actually have in production. So imagine you're building uh, an API or an RPC service. And in that API RPC service, you have to reach, uh, you have to hit four different URLs, okay? So in this case, they are represented with full bar, baz, and bat, right? And then for, in, and because those URLs, they are independent of each other, right? You want to hit all four of them concurrently, okay? So you want to hit all four of them at the same time. So in Elixir, we can use async string to process a collection, all right, uh, asynchronously, concurrently. And what I'm doing here to simulate uh, doing the request, I'm just sleeping by a handle, random amount between 100 and 300 milliseconds, okay? So what we're doing is that we're simulating concurrent work as if you're fetching a different uh, URLs. So if you're using this in production and you want to understand how it works, how the task module works, we can wrap in render sec trace and execute it. And you can see that every time we execute it, right, we get this diagram showing all the communication between the processes that is going to have to the URL. And every time we execute, you get something slightly different because you are sleeping by a different random amount, which would be very similar to what you have, what you have in production, right? So again, like now we can go to Livebook, bring pieces of code. You can actually connect Livebook to your actual application. Um, and start using these tools to understand our programs, uh, our software, our systems better. There is more we can do. Let me show another example when talking about visualizations. So, so far we know that, you know, Elixir is a functional programming language, runs on top of the Erlang virtual machine, right? And all of our code is running inside the processes, right? So we have those processes, we can create millions of those. They're very cheap, right? And there is one cool thing is that the Erlang virtual machine is really great for like monitoring and observability to the point that we can actually get all of the running processes. I can call process.list that is going to return all the running processes in the system. So what I'm doing in this code is that I say, look, I want to go for all the processes in the system, okay? And I want to get uh, information about each process, in particular, the number of reductions how much memory it's using and status, okay? So if the process is running or it's waiting, all right? Reductions is, think about it as gas, all right? So uh, processes in their labor virtual machine, they are preemptive, which means they only do some amount of work and then they stop for something else to run, okay? And the reductions is how much work they have done before they stop. So uh, it's like gas, right? Like how much fuel they have used to get to that point. So if a process is doing a lot of work, it's going to have a very high number of reductions, right? And then how much memory each process is using? Because each process is isolated, they have their own memory, right? In their own GC, right? And they status. So if I execute this code, we are going to get like a huge list, right? Each with like how much memory it's using, the PID, the amount of reductions, the if it's waiting or running. 
So we get this huge list, right? Which it helps. It gives us an idea. Maybe we could try like sorting this list. But again, we are in a rich medium. So how can we leverage this medium? So if you're anything like me, like I am good for web stuff, all right? And I am good at programming languages, but I am horrible at plotting or charting anything at all, right? Thankfully, Livebook has my back because besides code cells, it has this idea of smart cells, okay? So I'm, the be I'm just going to show how it works. So I'm going to click on the smart cell button and smart cells is a bunch of predefined tasks. In this case, we want to chart something. So I'm going to click on the chart. It's going to give me like this chart UI and we can say, okay, I want to chart uh, processes and Livebook automatically figure out that all the variables in the notebook, the only one it can actually plot is processes. So it already picked that. Point, uh, then we're going to chart points. I guess it's good. On the X axis, we're going to have the memory. Let's put the reductions on the Y axis and let's color them by status. So by just, you know, choosing some parameters in, in the chart, I'm going to evaluate the cell and we get something, right? There is a chart here. It's not ideal, right? But we got some initial feedback. So the first thing I want to do is that it's not wide enough. So let me, let's try 400 for the width. That's better. Okay, so we are iterating over this. But it looks at all the points. They are here, right? Like maybe the scale here, it's not good. So let's choose a log scale. Okay, that's better. Now we got some spread on the X axis. And so let's do the same for the Y one. And that's it, right? We just clicked around, right? And now we have some visualization of all the processes that are running in the system and how much memory they're using, um, how much work they have done so far. All we had to do is click around, right? But at this point, you may be thinking, yeah, Jose, that's cool, right? But it's like, you know, I can use Google Sheets, right? I can put this in Excel, right? Like I have used other UIs to plot chart for me, right? The special thing about um, smart cells is that all they can do at the end of the day, again, there's no global mutable state. So it's not like it's going there and accessing the notebook environment. All a smart cell can do at the end of the day is to execute some code. It's literally a metaprogramming UI. All the UI builds is some code that it gives for the notebook to run as if it was any other code cell. And the cool thing about it is that we can actually click this button and see the code that the smart cell generates, right? And this is great because if you don't know how to plot, right, something, you can go to Livebook, use the smart cell, and then get the code. And now from the code, right, you can go, you can visit the docs, you can learn more about the library, right? So you're not stuck. Because if you're using UI and then you need to customize the chart in a way that is not there in the UI, it's game over, right? They're like, oh, I have to pick another UI. I have to pick another tool. But here you can always fall back to the code, right? So just to show an example, right? We're talking about processes. Processes are running all the time, right? And the data that we have here is static, right? But the process, they're running all the time, which means it's actually dynamic. If I plot this chart every five seconds, I'm going to get something slightly different. So why don't we try that? And I'm, and I'm going to show, because of smart cells, how easy it is for us to do that. So what I'm going to do is that I'm actually going to convert the smart cell into an actual code cell so we can start iterating on it, okay? So this is an actual code cell now. I can evaluate as anything else. And we want to update this chart every five seconds. So the first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a new variable chart here. And we know that Kino is how we make things, we animate things, okay? So I'm going to render this chart. And what I'm going to do is that I want to listen to events. In this case, what I want to do is every 5,000 milliseconds, every five seconds, I want to plot the chart again, okay? So now I'm going to do something that I'm sure we never did before. I'm just going to copy and paste some code here. Uh, and I could abstract into a function, I'm just being lazy, right? So every five seconds, I'm going to compute all the process information again, and I'm going to clear the chart, and I'm going to is it render many, push many, and I'm going to 
push the new process information to the chart. So that's it, right? We got the chart that we had before, and every five seconds, we compute all the information again. Processes. Right? So we got the chart now, and after five seconds, it should... It updated. There is a bug, probably because I'm zoomed in, right? But now, every five seconds, it's updating, right? And we got to this result just from clicking around, okay? So... Yeah, so this is it. This is the first part of the talk. And as I say that, I realize that I forgot to say that this talk is split in two parts. <laughs> so this is the first part of the talk. This is an introduction on what you can do with Elixir, what you can do with Livebook. And Elixir is a functional concurrent language. As we saw, Livebook is a rich platform. And what I want to do for the second part of the talk is to actually live code a web application with machine learning features inside Livebook. Okay? We good? All right, so, that, so let's do this. All right, so because I'm going to build a web application right here, the first thing I need is a new code cell. And Elixir code, uh, it's usually defined inside modules. We have been calling modules like enum, kino, right? So I'm going to define a new module called my web. And because we want to build a web application, we have uh, this library called plug that allows us to compose and build web applications, okay? So I'm going to bring the plug builder functionality. And what the plug builder allows us to do is to define a series of steps that are executed whenever you receive a web request, okay? So we are going to have one step. So those steps are called plugs, right? We're going to have one step called render. And, this, and now I'm going to define this step as a regular function. So it's going to receive the connection. The connection is a data structure that represents the request and the response. And some options, those options I could pass here. We don't care about the options in this case, so we just ignore it. And what this is going to do is that it's going to send a response with status OK, 200, saying hello world, OK? And this is it. This is probably the smallest web application you can define in Elixir, all right? So we use something to build a series of, a series of steps. We have a single step that receives the connection and sends the response to 100 hello world over that connection. Now we need to run this web application on a web server. There are a couple web servers in Elixir. So I'm going to use one called Bandit and I'm going to write some code here now and I'm going to explain exactly what it does a little bit later, okay? So I'm going to say, look, I want to start a child uh, and the child is going to be of this bandit web server. So I'm starting a web server, passing the name of our web application, my web, on port 6789. Okay, so I'm going to execute this, and now it says, hey, I am running the my web thing with bandit at this version and at this port. And in order to show that it works, I'm going to use an HTTP client in another cell to access that port. Yeah, and then if I do this, you can see that we get a response back saying, yeah, here the status is 200, here are the headers, and you get a body of hello world, right? So that's it, right? We just wrote a very tiny web application, right? We are serving it over a port and we are doing requests to it, right? And here when we define a web application, we have this line here called Kino Star Child. And we can see that what this line returns is the result of the cell. And the result of the cell here you can see that it returns a PID. So this is returning a process. But you can see that Livebook automatically identified that, hey, this PID has a supervision tree attached to it. So let's click this. And as soon as we click this, we get like this really, 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 I don't think my voice can go any lower, really long tree, right? Like keeps on going, right? Here's the middle of the tree. And then there is another half. Right? So what is happening here? What is the supervision tree? So imagine you're building a web server for Elixir Erlang, right? We know it's a programming language that excels. It's a runtime programming language that excels at concurrency. So if you're building a web server for this programming language, what you want to do is say, look, if you want to listen to port 6789, what you're going to do is that you're going to start like 100 processes, like those cheap processes. You're going to start 100 of them and have, I think 100 is the default, and have all of them listen to that port. So as soon as somebody connects to that port, right, one of the parts is going to say, oh, somebody connected. 
I got this and I'm going to handle this request. And now the other 99, they're like, okay, now we are waiting for somebody. As soon as somebody connects, they're like, oh, okay, somebody else connected. I'm going to handle that request. So this tree here is giving us concurrency, right? What it's saying is like, look, as many things, many different clients, they're going to be connecting on that port to do HTTP requests. We have all those processes just waiting there to get that connection and start handling it, right? So it's giving us concurrency. So not only that, it's giving us concurrency and scalability, it's giving us something more. Because imagine this, imagine you build your web server and you put it in production, right? And now imagine that somebody wants to attack your web server, right? They want to be malicious. So what they do is that as soon as they connect, they send you some bad data, bad information, right? They are trying to make your application crash. And imagine that they succeed. They make the thing that accepted that, remember, we had a hundred of them. And then imagine one of them picks that up and it's like, oh, I received bad data, something goes wrong, and that process crashes. Imagine if that process goes wrong and it crashes. If that thing crashes, it means that now you only have 99 acceptors, right? And then the malicious attacker is going to continue doing the same thing until you have 90 acceptors, until you have 50, until you have 10, until you have zero. And then that web server is no longer being able to accept requests, which would be a disaster. So Erlang has this philosophy, which is like, look, if you're building distributed systems, things that run on, uh, on top of a socket, things are going to go wrong, right? So what they say is if something goes wrong, if, there is an ex if you accept a request, you get bad data, it's fine for that process to crash. They say, let it crash. It's fine for that process to crash because that process is going to have a supervisor and that supervisor is going to say, oh, I see that this process terminated for an expected reason. So I'm just going to start another one in its place, right? So it restarts, it heals the system back to a working state. And this is exactly what this is doing. This is a large tree because we are starting several acceptors and supervisors to manage those acceptors, okay? So this tree here, this really, really, really long tree, right? Is doing, is giving us scalability and fault tolerance, all right? So let's go back to raw so I don't have to scroll that again. And so that's what this line is doing. It's starting a process that represents a supervision tree. And before we go into the uh, AI part, there is one change I want to do to the web application to make it more interesting, which is let's make it so we actually read some of the request parameters. Okay, so let's say I want to read the name, oops, name, and interpolate it here, all right? And let's pass the name as a parameter. Name, Jose. And as soon as it is executed, we got an error. And the reason why we got an error is because plug by default does not fetch the request information if you don't need. But if we add another step here, so it has a built-in step called fetch query params. If I say, hey, before I render the thing, I want to fetch the query parameters. I do the request again, it works, right? So now it's saying, hey, hello, Jose, right? Uh, hello, Lambda, right? So there you go. Our application is working, still very simple, and now we're receiving request parameters. So let's get to the machine learning part. And again, um, I'm good at web stuff. I'm good with programming languages. I don't know anything about machine learning. And Livebook has our back. So let's go to smart cells. And what I want to do here is that we have all those things that it can, it can do. And it also has this smart cell called neural network task. So I'm going to select that. And once again, it creates a UI for us with a bunch of predefined machine learning tasks. And what is really cool about this is that all those tasks, they are actually machine learning models implemented in Elixir, right? And then we have a library called Numerical Elixir that can get a subset of Elixir and compile it to run on the GPU or just in time to the CPU. So you have a bunch of tasks predefined. My favorite is the speech-to-text one. So... So I, I select the task, I'm going to evaluate the cell, and what it's going to do is that it's going to give me a form to interact with a machine learning model. So in this case, speech to text is a form that receives audio. So let's give this a try. Hello darkness, my old friend. Let's see, I'm going to run the model. The first time it runs the model is going to compile that module, so it takes a while, and if it got my accent, yes, it worked, right? So we just clicked around. Now I have a machine learning model running inside our notebook. 
thanks to smart cells. And there are a bunch of things that we can do for simplicity for our web application. And, and you know, if you want to say, hey, Jose, how does that work, right? Just go check the code, right? And remember that it's always code. All the smart cell do at the end of the day, right, is to uh, generate some code. So let's pick another, ta uh, another task, like task classification, because it's going to be much simpler for a web application to work with text instead of audio. So I'm going to pick another one, text classification. And this is going to use a model that does emotion analysis. We can see here, right? So there is a text here. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So if we run this, it says, okay, the emotion here is surprise. And the thing about machine learning models is that it doesn't say, hey, this is surprise. It always returns probabilities, right? So it's saying, look, I am like 99% sure the emotion here is surprise, right? So if we say Elixir is awesome, it says it's joy, all right, 97%. Uh, Joseph's talk is boring. Disgust, right? So 96% that it's disgust, the emotion there. Right, so again, we have a machine learning model running. We can do interesting things with it, right? And what we really want to do is that we want to embed that into our web application. How are we going to do that? Well, let's start by understanding the code. So I'm already going to go ahead and convert this smart cell into a code cell, okay? And let's see what this code is doing. So it's using a library called Bumblebee. And this library, what it does is that it has a bunch of predefined machine learning models, okay? So uh, when we use a machine learning model, it's because somebody implemented the model and somebody trained that model, okay? So we have the implementation in Elixir. And what we need to do here is that we need to load the parameters that make that model works, okay? So in this case, we are loading this particular model from Hugging Face, right? And we also load the tokenizer because machine learning models, like computers, they only work with numbers. So we need a way to convert words, uh, syllables into numbers, and that's what a tokenizer does, right? It's going to convert, it's going to break words apart, right? And convert part of the words into a number representing each of them. And then finally, we define a serving. A serving is, a, is literally a task. It's a common term in machine learning that says, hey, a serving is something that encapsulates some machine learning task activity. So in this case, we are starting a text classification task, passing the model info, the tokenizer, and some parameters. All right. So that thing, this first cell here defines the model. And the second cell is much more straightforward. All it does is that it defines the form that we interact with the model. So what it's doing here is that it's defining a text area. It's defining, in the next line, it's defining a form, okay, with a submit button, and then a frame. And the frame is where it's a process where we can send the results. So what we do is that every time somebody submits the form, remember before we used Kino Listen to say every five seconds do something? Now you're saying Kino Listen on the form, which means every time somebody submits the form, we are going to receive some text. And the first thing that we do is uh, to print something on the screen saying, hey, it's running, okay? So let's see this working, All right? So as soon as somebody submits a form, we update the frame to say it's running. So let's see that. So pay attention here at the bottom. As soon as I click run, it showed running, right? And then the results came really fast and then it showed the results. So that's what this is doing, saying, look, I want to put the text running in that frame, right? And then it goes to the machine learning model and say, hey, do the text classification on this text. And that's it, right? So uh, it gives us the output. The output is a list of predictions. Each prediction has a label, like surprise, and a score. We render that into this rich UI component called scored list, which we can see here. And that's it. And then we render that into the frame. That's what this code is doing, right? That's the machine learning task. So with this in hand, Right, we can start thinking about how we are going to put this into our web app. But before we move the code around, there is one change that I want to do. Because what this code is doing is that whenever somebody, whenever somebody clicks the form, it's going to the machine learning model and say, hey, check if this text, check the emotion on this text, right? It's doing that immediately. But if you're running this in production, what you want to do, especially if you're running this on the GPU, GPU is really good at doing things in parallel. Right? So what you want to do in production is that if you have a lot of people using your web application, right? Like doing some, if you have to do sentiment analysis on a bunch of different texts, what you want to do is that you want to batch them. You want to like batch into 32, 64, 128 of them. And then when you have a batch 
of them, you send the whole batch to the GPU, and the GPU is going to be way more efficient, right, at computing the sentiment for the whole batch instead of doing one by one. Okay, so we want to do a little bit of batching. How are we going to do that? So I'm going to go to the cell that defines the machine learning model. And once again, we are going to use Kino Star Child. Okay, and we are going to start now a NX serving child. And this NX serving is, we know that Kino Star Child is going to start a process, right? So this process is going to be the thing that does the batching. It's going to accumulate requests from a bunch of different places and create a batch. We are going to pass it the serving and we need to give it a name I'm just going to call it my AI. The name can be anything. It doesn't matter, right? So I am starting a, a process that does the batching for us. And in order to use it, all I need to do is that here, I wanted to do, instead of run, we want to do a batched run. And we're going to pass the name of the batcher process. So that's it. I did those two changes and everything should still work. Except that now when we put this into production, right, it's going to perform much better because we are batching all those requests. All right, we've done all of that. Let's move this into our web application, okay? So let me get this code and let me paste it here, all right? So all I did is to get the machine learning model code and I just pasted it, right? Copy and paste, actually more precisely, a cut and paste into the web application. All right, and what we are doing is that, look, before we start the web application, let us start the machine learning model, all right? And the other line that we need is this one. And what we are going to do is that now, whenever there is a request, let's fetch the text that we want to classify as the text parameter. So I'm going to receive a text, and we are going to send that to the machine learning model, my AI, right? So let's send it there, okay? And it's going to do the sentiment analysis. And we know that the output is going to return predictions and predictions is a list, right? With the most likely prediction first and then the others. So in Elixir, we can do pattern matching as well as most other functional programming languages. So this is going to return the head and the tail of the list. Let's only care about the first element, right? The, the most likely prediction. And I want to pattern match. We know that this returns a label and a score. Let's just get the label and say this was label, all right? So this is it. This is our web app. We change a little bit. Now on every request, we go to the machine learning model, get the result, and we're going to render this on the page. So let's update our web application, right? We, ha we have updated, we evaluated the cell. And now if I do, if I change the request to say, hey, the text is going to be Elixir is awesome. We get this was joy, right? Right here. Right? So yeah, it's doing. It's already doing the machine learning things for us. Uh, what was the other one? Jose stock is boring. And this was disgust, right? It's working, right? So we we got the machine learning functionality. We brought into our application. We start the machine learning model with the web server and start serving requests. Okay. So I'm almost done with the talk. There's just one more thing I want to show. Okay. Uh, which is the following. So imagine that you build this web application, right? You put in production is a massive success. VCs are knocking at your doors like, hey, take our money, right? And then you're starting to gain more and more users, right? And then you realize that you, even though we added batching, we have to scale this better in production. And what usually you want to do if you're running anything with AI in the future, uh, in production, is that you're going to have like 10 machines serving web requests, and inside your cluster, you're going to have some machines doing the GPU with a GPU doing, doing the machine learning tasks. So for example, I have like 10, 10 machines as the, the web server, right? And then internally, you have four different machines, usually big, powerful machines running the machine learning models, right? And then as the requests come, you send the machine learning tasks to those machines with GPU. So if you're using pretty much any other programming language, Doing this, going from this code where the machine learning model is running with the web backend to a separate infrastructure would require a lot of work, right? Would require maybe setting up a new web server, a new web application, choosing between JSON, gRPC, or some whatever communication protocol to make those things talk together, right? But I want to show how we would do this in Elixir, right? Because we have been talking about Elixir being a, an Erlang, being concurrent programming languages, but they also come with distribution built in. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to open up a new notebook, okay? I'm going to open up a new notebook, and each notebook is effectively a separate operating system process, okay? So they are completely isolated from each other, right? This is a completely separate Elixir Erlang runtime. And what I'm going to do, the first thing is that I will get all the dependencies. So I have been using code in this notebook. It's because I've installed all those dependencies before, right? So I'm going to get the same dependencies from that other notebook, copy and paste here, and install them. And while the dependencies install, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to get the machine learning model from here, okay? So I'm removing it, okay? I remove it from our web application and I'm putting it here, okay? So this is a new notebook, a completely separate operating system process. In this case, it's running on the same machine as mine, but it could be running on a completely separate machine in, in the same cluster, okay? Now, if I go back to my web application, reload it and do the request, it fails, right? Because it's like, hey, you want me to like do this like machine learning task, right? But you know, I don't have this machine learning process here, my AI, this thing does not exist, right? So it fails, we are getting a bunch of errors. But here's the thing, we can actually connect, so those are two separate Erlang virtual machine instances. We can actually connect them together, being the same machine or in the same cluster. And the way to do that is that every Erlang instance has a node name and a cookie. And the cookie is the secret like to, uh, to talk to that machine. So I'm going to get the node name and the cookie, okay? So this is in the new notebook that I created, right? That only has the machine learning model, right? So uh, I get the node name and the cookie. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to come back to the web application and I'm going to say, look, I have this node given by this and I have this cookie. Uh, and I want to say that the cookie for that node are those values, right? So I'm going to say, hey, if, when you talk to that node, use this cookie. And then I want to connect to that node. And then as soon as I do this, whoops, I did something wrong. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So as soon as I do this, right, now I start my web application again, but with those two machines connected to each other. So now when I do a web request, it works, right? This was disgust. Because again, they are in a cluster and our machine learning framework knows like, hey, you want to do some machine learning task, but I know that I don't have anything on this machine, but I know somewhere else in this cluster, it's doing exactly the task that you need. So we are going to route the request there. And we didn't have to change a single line of code of our application, right? All we had to do is to connect the machines together and we have a bunch of tools that does this automatically for you. So if you're running on Fly, on AWS, on Google Cloud, whatever, right? There are already tools that know how to ping the proper APIs and connect everything, right? So everything just works transparently because distribution is built team, it's part of the, the Erlang virtual machine, it's part of the environment. And we build an ecosystem around these foundations, right? So that's what I wanted to show you today. I wanted to show a little bit of Erlang, Elixir, concurrency, distribution, web and machine learning. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.